So onsets then rise. What are onsets? What do I call onsets? It is customary uh, to talk of rhymes as being the main vowel of a syllable plus whatever follows it in the syllable. And so, of course, the onset would be the rest. That is, anything, well, everything from the beginning of the word or the syllable, depending, to the main vowel. So, a word consists of an onset and a rhyme. This is the structure of the word, such as I presented it yesterday. The onset is from the beginning to the medial, including the medial. That's it's this. So including the R, if there is one. And the rhyme is the main vowel to the end, that is the rhyming part. That's the rhyme. Okay, so what I'll do this morning is tell you about the evolution of onsets. So what evidence do we have on all Chinese onsets? We have evidence of various kinds. It used to be, um, it used to be the case that when, when I was learning old Chinese, what, what I heard was that we had two main bodies of evidence to reconstruct old Chinese, one being the rhyming in the shitting and the other being the, the system of phonetics in the, in the script. Uh, the rhyming told us about the end of words, and the phonetics told us both about the end and the beginning. So we have two sources telling us about the rhymes, but only one source telling us about the phonetics, uh, about the, um, the onsets. And uh, this was taken to be the explanation for the fact, or rather the feeling, that our reconstruction of uh, onsets was not very good compared to what we could achieve with the rhymes. But now, in the present approach, we use more types of evidence than that. And so we have more evidence that we can allow to bear on the reconstruction of onsets. Specifically, we have the phonetic series, as always. We have the word families, and that's, that's new. That's, uh, word families give you a lot of evidence, a lot of uh, of the interpretable evidence on all Chinese onsets, and that's in part what I've, what I've tried to do in my book of 1999. And finally, we have modern dialects, like the mean dialects, they tell us about onsets. And we also have loans to neighboring languages, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, as you've seen, complex can be simple, and, you know, the symbol of onset is reduced to the C1 consonant, but they can also be quite complex. Uh, complex onset has a consonant before the C1 and an R after the C1. That's the most com complex type of onset you can have. Uh, well, in fact, you can even have more complex in, in the case in, if you have two, two prefixes. Now, how many onsets are there? We can uh, calculate the number of possible onsets in, th in theory by multiplying the number of elements that occur in each, at each slot. So we have six pre-initials, so at least these, uh, capital N, N, S, T, K, and a, an iambic onset. A, a, minor syllable, which I collapse as capital C, as any, any, any consonant plus schwa. So that's six. Then you get 68 initials, 34 type A, 34 type B. Okay. And then you have the possibility of having one medial, R. Right, so, uh, so that's nine, 952 possible combinations. 
in theory, of course. That doesn't mean all these combinations are sort of tactically possible. There will be combinations or combinations that are never tested, never, uh, not even possible. For instance, it's very likely impossible that you cannot have both an R initial and an R medial at the same time. Okay, so that is probably a gap. And there are most likely many other gaps in, 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 the, in, the, in the table. But we don't know what they are. We would like to know what they are. Now, we've tried to um, give you a list of the attested evolutions, the evolutions that we think are attested, out of these nine, five, 952 possible combinations, there is a certain certain amount, maybe 200 or maybe more than that, I don't know, that we think are attested so far. Uh, that is, our database is not complete yet, or it's maybe a third complete. We have reconstructions for about a third of the words. So we have about 200 evolutions. And these are listed in the document entitled o OC Onsets and their evolution to Middle Chinese, which you can find on our site under Tuesday. Okay. So look at this document. It's all right, now let's take a closer look at these onsets. And first, the basic question that, well, the, the most basic question we want to ask is about the C1. What kinds of C1s are there? I've already told you yesterday, I've already shown you a, a table of uh, possible C1s. And as you remember, you may remember, there are three sets of stops. The stops are really the backbone of, of the, of the logical system and in this case we distinguish three uh, sets of stops in all Chinese voiceless and aspirated the, the, ke, voiceless aspirated ke, 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 and voiced the, the, the. Okay, so at any given point of articulation you will have three three stops for the labial point of articulation, it will be per, per, per. Right? And then per, per, per. And then per, per, per. And for the Africans, it will be z, sorry, z, z, z. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, all systems after Calgren, Calgren had four, but he had, he had, a, he had two kinds of voice, but it's generally recognized now that this was an error. Um, since the Fangui system in 1971, everybody reconstructs three. Uh, per, And why does one reconstruct three? Well, basically, the people have not really been looking for evidence that there were really three. Uh, they reconstruct three because there are three in Middle Chinese. It's the same three in Middle Chinese. And by default, what one does when reconstructing Old Chinese is just project back Middle Chinese onto Old Chinese. Okay, so if Middle Chinese is three, and we have no clear, there is no obvious explanation for why there are three, well then, for why there are... I mean, there's no obvious... There, there, but, there is no obvious case of uh, complementary distribution between any of the two, so you just by default you can start three. That's what I think about. But we think we have uh, we have found some kind of evidence that we are really three in all Chinese, and that comes from the from the from the system of uh, phonetics. Uh, there are we've been looking for phonetic series in the same rhyme that could illustrate this distinction. And we found series like these, a few, not many, but a few series like these, where each of the series only contains 
things like this, or uh, uh, KK, KKO, KKHO, and GGO. Okay, so this will be Go, Ko, Ho, with different tones, maybe a, maybe a, a medial R, things like that, but in any case, just that. Okay? And with little lexical overlap. That's a very important point. Because very often a, a, a word family will be distributed over several series. But here there isn't the word families are the word families in the Go series are not found in the Co series and not and not in the Ho series. So there is no lexical overlap. That means that suggests strongly that there were words pronounced as co that they put there, but words pronounced as co that they put there, and words pronounced as go that they put. Uh, I think we can get confirmation of these uh, tripartite uh, structure in early loans to Yao Yao, which does show, at least in unprefix cases, it does show uh, G world going to G, K H going to K H, and K going to K. So, well. It's not great news, but it's good to have some kind of confirmation that this is the way it really works. Now, this poses a problem with Tibetan Brahman, of course, because Tibetan Brahman, as I was saying, is currently reconstructed with two series, voiced and voiceless. And so the question arises as to how, how the two series of TV and the, one, and the three series of Chinese relate. Is it, did, did Chinese add one, like Tibetan, Tibetan has added one in the course of history, and other TV languages too have added, a, have added one, uh, usually the, the aspirated series uh, is, uh, is new in Tibetan world languages. So maybe Chinese also enriched its two series with the third aspirated series, but if that's the case, we have no clue as to how the, as to how the aspirated series uh, uh, arose. Okay, now we have we have three series in Old Chinese, three series in Middle Chinese. There is a direct line of descent between each, an aspirated, voiceless and aspirated to voiceless and aspirated. Voiceless aspirated to voiceless aspirated, voiced to voiced. However, the, there have been changes in between, and the changes are due to, of course, they are due to nasal prefixes, which take elements from the voiceless series and move them into the voiced series. Okay. So there are more voiced words in Middle Chinese than Old Chinese. Okay. In mid, the, the voiced words of Middle Chinese have two origins, one original voiced words, and second original voiceless words that have been voiced by a nasal prefix. These are the main evolutions. Uh, voiceless stops preceded by the capital N prefix go to B, go to, go to voiced. Okay, and you see a lot of alternations in, in, in Middle Chinese between transitive verbs with a voiceless initial and the corresponding intransitive with the, with the corresponding voiced initial, and that's due to the end prefixation. Okay, so these are secondary voiced words. You also get voicing due to the M prefix, MPB, and the M prefix voice is not only a, a, a plain voiceless stop, it also voices an aspirated stop. However, we have found no cases, no clear cases of this. Right? So we're, we're thinking <coughs> this capital M doesn't voice an aspirate. We don't, that may change in future, but for the moment that's, that's what we think. All right, now at this point, uh, I would like to 
review uh, other proposals, another proposal, to account for the alternation of voiced and voiceless stops in middle China, in, in, in morphological conditions. For instance, you remember uh, Ye, to separate. There's two readings in middle Chinese. One with P, <coughs> and that's a transitive verb, to separate two things. And a second reading is with a B. That, that would be Biet. Biet means to separate, transitive, and Biet means to leave, in transitive. Okay. Now, in this, in the present framework, we use the intransitive end prefix to explain that. We, we, we suppose the, the word has a voiceless root initial, a voiceless P, and the N voices it to B. But other scholars, such as Gong Huangtang, believe that this voice, voiceless distinction is not due to a, name, to a voicing prefix. They think, he thinks, the alternation, he thinks the root is originally voiced, yet, and the B is devoiced by a causative S prefix. Okay, so the word, the, the, the root would be yet to leave, and if you put an S prefix in front of it that will both devoice the B to a P, you will get, you will get yet, and it will make the word, the, the word, it will change the, 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 the word's meaning from leave to cause to leave, which is to, maybe, to separate. Uh, now, we don't think that's correct, because in our opinion, S does not devoice a following voiced obstruent. On the contrary, we have, we see cases the, the, the question is, where does Z come from? You know, you, the, the middle Chinese has a Z, and we have found many cases where that Z, middle Chinese Z, does the same morphological job as S. For instance, in, in eat and feed, you remember? To eat, and eat is shi, feed is si. <coughs> Old Chinese is muluk, to eat. Feed is simlux. Okay? So this S, which is obviously causative, applicative, whatever, changes to Z here. And it changes to Z because it is followed by mlu. And, and but it, it changes to it changes to Z after Muller itself turns to G. So the S preceding, we think S changes to Z when it precedes a voiced obstruct. It's not like what Gong says. Gong says S will devoice the voiced obstruct. But cases like S show you that S actually is the one that gets voiced by a following voiced obstruct. All right? So the explanation, the uh, interpretation that says that the alternation between P and B in, in, in words like PA is due to an S prefix, doesn't work. I'm not sure if I... Is, is that clear? Clear? Yes? Okay, so here are some examples of voicing by capital N. So the, three, the first three examples are examples of what we think capital N does to a um, voiceless stop. Well, it voices it, as you can see here, here, and here. And we know, uh, and in, in all these cases, we have alternations 
word family alternations with voiceless initials, and in min, for those of these which are attested in min, they go to unaspirated. When they devoice, they devoice as unaspirated, they devoice as unaspirated. And when they are found in yal yal, they have a nasal, a pre-nasal, a pre-nasal aspiration. Now, voicing by M is a, uh, is a little different. As I said, M voices the following voiceless stop, the stop or affricate, both unaspirated and aspirated. I haven't given you examples of aspirated here, but you can find them in the, in the document that I've uh, uploaded. Uh, Oh, sorry, that's not a good example. Either. This is not a stop. You shouldn't have put that there. Forget this example. It's not. Uh, it's not good. Uh, now, example is Chuang, there, where the initial was T S and N voices it to D Z, and this is a hammer, initial T R. M voices it to DR. Uh, here, the M is probably the M that changes uh, verbs into instrument nouns. We have a verb, truly, meaning to, have to, to, to crush. So, the hammer is the crusher. And when Pergamon has reflexes, when, when these forms are, re are reflected in Ptolemy, they get voiced aspirated initials. That is, initials that will be voiced into aspects. So, uh, so the two kinds of voicing have different functions. Uh, they don't uh, voice the same kind of sounds, and they have different reflexes in but both have pre-nasalizes reflexes in the other. Did I understand it right? That in the cream, there is supposed to be a voiced, um, aspirated initial. Is it right? Is it no, that's, that, uh, that's, that's yeah. Norman's. Yeah. Uh, that's Norman's term. Yeah, yeah. I, I, our, I our explanation is different. I, yeah, I, our I explanation is what I, I uh, yeah. explained yesterday. We yeah. think that. Actually, these. It's a soft. Uh, no, no, no. That's uh, not softened because yeah. there's no, there's no schwa. These are not yeah, yeah, okay. uh, Our explanation for the, the divorcing pattern in me is different. I mean, it's we use the categories that Norman identified. Mm -hmm. Norman had identified three kind, three categories: uh, plain, what he calls plain voice stops, and these devoices voiceless. Initial voiceless stops mm -hmm. and uh, okay, like these. Mm -hmm. uh, because remember, Norman observed that all adjectives be voiced like this. Yeah. Then he identified uh, words that be voiced that be voiced into aspirates. Mm -hmm. He has no explanation for it, but he finds that some of the of words, some of the words which have Middle Chinese. Middle Chinese B D G devoiced as an aspirate mm -hmm. and others as aspirated. And he found he finds a third category which is what he calls softened initials. Yeah, now so so he has three categories of voice. B, B and mm -hmm. what he calls hyphen B. Yeah. Hyphen B is softened. Mm -hmm. So here's these three. Mm -hmm. Our explanation for the three is that our old Chinese B, we have old Chinese B, goes, goes there. Mm -hmm. Our old Chinese MP also goes there, so they merge. Then MP goes there. Mm -hmm. 
and the softened one come from M schwa. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Now why is it like that? Why would M produce an aspiration while capital M does not? In our view, the what happened in the history of, of, of me, in the early history of me, was that the, the, the first thing that happened was that these guys, NT, NT, and NP, first voiced and they merged with original BDG. Okay, so these and BDG merge, and then they devoiced mm -hmm. first, and they devoiced as NS Place. Mm -hmm. But at, but at the same time, MT, MP, MK had become voiced, but they had not devoiced because the M was still there mm -hmm. to protect them. Okay, mm -hmm. so these guys devoiced later. They devoiced in the second round of devoicing. This, the first round of devoicing was maybe uh, maybe in, in the first centuries of the common era. Mm -hmm. And this one is in the last centuries of the first millennium, in 800, 900, mm -hmm. the second round of, of devoicing mm -hmm. is at the same time as Hakka, mm -hmm. with, which, vo which devoices at the same time. Okay, so 9th, 10th, maybe 11th, 12th, around 1000. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a later kind of devoicing. Okay. Yeah, just the, the, the question I already had yesterday was just when I saw that um, that um, uh, I, I just asked myself if there, there is a hypothesis like this, if someone or why or why not, um, uh, or if there is a hypothesis which re-established Cargrin's uh, uh, assumption that there is a voice, uh, an aspirated voice consonant, but this never. No, 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 no. at all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, 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 in, no, in Norman's mind, I don't think yeah. Norman excluded it. Yeah. I mean, Norman had the, Norman did not have the idea, probably does not have the idea that these are two rounds of devoicing. I think he yeah. would probably suppose there's only one round and two different kinds of mm -hmm. uh, of sounds which devoice in different ways. Mm -hmm. But we think it's more natural to suppose two rounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, examples of preservation of nasal prefixes by Paul of Mongyen. Okay, Chang, Paul of Mongyen, Ndang. Chong, the middle one, that's a noun. It's a noun with the S suffix that nominalizes, okay? But without the S, you would probably have a, 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 a stated verb to be in the middle. And that would give you tone A, and that's what you find in Proto Mongyen, where you have indeed you have a dung in tone A, which means the middle or to be in the middle. Then you have draw, muddy, Proto Mongyen, and draw. And it's normal for, cap for K to be reflected as capital C, that's the normal. Qing. Uh, sorry, there's an error here. It's, uh, it should give you. I'm sorry, there's a, there's a problem with this example. Forget it. <laughs> uh, now, this is a case where Proof of Mongian has a prenasal and we suppose, for that reason, we suppose a prenasal in Chinese, but as explained previously, we think capital N does not devote, does not voice an aspect. So what you get in Middle Chinese is this. Okay? An, 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 uh, an aspect, a voiceless aspect. But don't you, for instance, uh, Sorry? 
committee in such cases when capital plan does not divorce the initial um, country says that this is for instance the loss kind of young big suffix which swell which falls without leaving a trace. You could you could say that, but the point is we don't have good examples of capital N voicing an aspirate. We think mm -hmm. capital N does not voice uh, aspirates. We think that's the explanation. Rather, the, the explanation that you propose is possible too. Uh, a, a very interesting example is the word Kai to open. Kai has been low, has been borrowed by Miao Yao, specifically by, by Miao, by Mien, and it exists in two forms in Mien. There's, there is a form Koi to A, which means to open transitive. And another form, nkoi, tone A, which means to open in transitive, like a flower, the flower opens, or the heart opens to be happy. Uh, now this, this, this is a, a loan from Chinese, and it's not a real form. So they must have borrowed nkoi in transitive. There must have existed an nkai, in Chinese at some point, which they borrowed in the intransitive meaning. And then the reason why you don't find a guy in Middle Chinese for to open intransitive is simply because in kai just normally goes to normally goes to kai in, in Middle Chinese. So kai, the kai transitive and the in kai intransitive of Old Chinese merged as Middle Chinese kai transitive and intransitive. And here's another example which I already gave him yesterday. Which, so this is the intransitive of crepe to press. Examples of the N prefix being retained in Yao Yao. You remember this example, a, a column, a pillar, which is the instrumental of TRO to support. Well, this is borrowed by Hong Yen as NJ. And it's also borrowed by one Kadai language with a, with a prenasal. So this really has a prenasal. Uh, the word for nose, which has an N. That's the N body part of it. Uh, this example, uh, hom, uh, uh, han, keep in mouth, which we construct as yi hong, or hong yang eng. And catch with chopsticks for a home yen in the chat. The capital P means we don't know where it's a P or a B. It's not this is this is an old uh, we wouldn't write it like this now. We would write a P between square brackets. So this I've just been taking examples from old older files. Oh, this is just a obsolete notation. Examples of the iambic nasal prefix uh, preserved in Hong Yen. Now, this, these examples are not very uh, uh, Well, in fact, these are in fact these are examples where Hong is the main reason for us to reconstruct an iambic iambic prefix. Okay, for instance, Pao to report. Pro Hong Yen is in Bu, tone C, and it has because the initial of, of Pao is not voiced. We have to reconstruct. We have to reconstruct a nasal prefix, but because it doesn't voice the initial, we have to reconstruct it as iambic. Pu uh, to patch up. We discussed this example yesterday, and that's better because here we have 
uh, we know from mean, mean has a, indeed mean has a, a soft combination. So in that case, we are confident that the reason why mean has a soft initial and yaw yaw as a nasal prefix is because there was an iambic prefix in the Chinese form. Okay? Iambic nasal prefix in the Chinese form. Uh, this, is, it's, this is the same kind of case. We have, we have I think, uh, a softened initial in mean. All right. Other example. Okay? So that was telling you about secondary voicing by nasal prefixes. Any questions, comments? If not, we move on to the next sub subject, which is what type A and type B do to you. Uh, so type A, the main thing about type A is that you don't get any kind of palatalization. You, initials do not get palatalized. Velar initials do not get palatalized. Then, uh, our velar initials do not get palatalized. They remain as velar dentals. As if something prevented the, the tongue from moving forward. If, if something was pulling on the tongue to keep it kind of back and low, right? So something like <coughs> retracted tongue root would be a good a good reason for this to happen. As we will see in type B, we get a lot, we get two kinds of palatalization. So the, the tongue is free to move, to move forward. Uh, another thing that we see in type A is that laterals, type A laterals, both L and the voiceless L, become stops, D and TH. For instance, a word Lam goes to tan, speak. Or tao comes from a double L. Or tang, soup, hot liquid, comes from H, voiceless L. Clang. Or ting, to listen, comes from voiceless L. Now, uh, there's something interesting about this, the way that Miao Yao represents this double L. Uh, there's a, a few words, two, three words, two, three double L words borrowed in, in Miao Yao, one of which is Tao, peach. Uh, and peach is represented as uvular GL, it's gla and there's a couple of other words, a couple of other double L words, which are also rendered as gla in Polokmania. Now this is interesting because there's no trace of a, of a uvular, there's no trace of a velar in Chinese. However, suppose that as we think, the um, characteristic of type A was pharyngealization, then you get a pharyngealized L, which is something like la, and la can sound to foreign ears pretty much like a gla. Okay, so we think that's the reason why a total meow yaw has gla or double L. Another example comes from Tokarian. Tokarian B has a word for rice. As you may know, the Tokarians uh, cultivated rice in the, uh, in the oasis of the uh, Tahuanacan Desert. They did have rice. The, and they got rice from the Chinese. And the, the word for rice is a loan word from Chinese. It's the Tao, which we can say. Okay. Now, in Tokarian, you do not get a, you do not, you do not have gl, they do not have a, G, a GL cluster, but they have a KL cluster. So, it seems that the Tokarian herd, the Tokarians 
heard the word as pronounced by the Chinese as glue, whereas they could not pronounce glue, they rendered it as clu. Now it's, it seems that what the Tocharians heard is the same thing that the Protomonians heard. That's that's the pharyngealized thing. Okay. Uh, I wanted to know if there was no other language in which you have this word borrowed. What language? The, in the other language. This is, you know, I haven't found it. Uh, oh. In the oh. No, no, you don't have Tao because uh, because all the languages around around China have had rice for a long, long time, so they don't borrow the word for rice. Uh, the Tocharians who did not have rice did borrow it. Uh, so I don't know of any other examples. There may be. Okay, so this kind of evidence here is suggestive that what type A did, what type A consisted of was, was pharyngealization. At least it's, it's really consistent with that. And, and Bill will tell you this afternoon about what type A does to valves. And also it seems that it keeps valves down and back, like as if there's something pulled on the, on the tongue. Now, what are the effects of type B? The effects are uh, the opposite, there's a lot of palatalization, two kinds of palatalization. One, palatalization of velars before front valves, and that's that's old. That's the first kind of palatalization that occurs in Chinese. For instance, you get a, a, a word, zhi, a branch, is qi in Polonian. So, but we have zhi in Chinese, zhi in, 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 in Middle Chinese. Coming from Middle Chinese, zhi is powerful initial. So obviously we are faced, we are faced with a word that was Old Chinese ke, and that was powerfulized zhi in Middle Chinese, but not in Middle. We can see examples of, you know, there, there are also, we can also see other Vila, we can see Vila, so other Vila words in the same phonetic series. For instance, paraphrasation will be blocked by an R. If there's an R here, paraphrasation will block it. But the R will not prevent the scribes from using this, this phonetic. So we'll, you will have this phonetic for K and Kre, and the result in Middle Chinese is that you will have K will go to Chie in Middle Chinese, but Kre will go to Chie. So you will have in the series a mixture of Chi and K. So that's how you can that's how you can tell these parallelized beavers. And that occurs uniquely before from Uh Now there is a I don't know if I have the time to tell you. Maybe I won't. Maybe in the discussion we'll talk about it. Maybe some of you will say. But I know cases where uh, you get phonetic series uh, that have both velars and paraphrases, and the vowel is not front. So maybe some of you will say that, and then we'll discuss it. Now, not just velars paraphrase, but our velar stops also paraphrase. And that happens before all vowels. Okay. Vilars was only front vowels in type B, but our Vilar stops the 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 and n also paraphrase before all vowels. It, it's enough that you have type B if you're paraphrase. Example is true to pronounce or go out. That's palatalization before a back vowel, and that's probably because why why do you get palatalization before a, a, a back vowel? Well, that's that's old Chinese. By the time of Middle Chinese, a medial glide had a, had occurred here, and it's the medial glide, the medial year that produced 
Tehát induljunk a felelőzésre. Catalyzation preceding a front vowel, but for the same reason, appearance of a appearance of a medial glide, because the type A uh, does not have a glide. Catalyzation preceding a after after uh, no, sorry preceding catalyzation of D preceding a low vowel. Explanation for the appearance of this medium from old Chinese between old Chinese and middle Chinese? Well, the explanation is probably that the, uh, because we're in type B, yeah. the vowels are free to move up. So, in the process of moving up, they get diphthongized. You get A becomes E, E becomes E, uh, central vowel U becomes U, U becomes. Uh, U becomes a B. U, O becomes O, and then the details are not clear, but there must be a fronting process that gets all these glides fronted to a given. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will paralyze the preceding one. This is already done, by the way, in uh, in Lake Han. Mm -hmm. You can see that the in Buddhist transcriptions they use they use these words words like these to transcribe Sanskrit paraphrases. So these were they were already paraphrased. Yes. Mm -hmm. Catalyzation of laterals, an L in type B will paralyze to a yod in, in uh, Middle Chinese, and that's a very that's a very common situation. This ex this change explains why in phonetic series like this one you get both D's and TH in type A and Y in type B because all Chinese laterals go to D and TH in type A and to Yod or Xi in type B. So in the same series you will get T, T, sorry, you will get T, D, Y, Sh, but not T. Okay? You understand why? Type A L will go to D or TH, but it will not go to T. Type B L will go to Y or C, but it will not go to I don't know what. So in the series, in lateral series, series that were lang in old Chinese, lang type A, lang type B, lang type A, lang type B, you will get a mix of in Middle Chinese, you will get a mix of D, TH, Yod, Qi, but not T. And that's how you can tell these here, because they don't have T. And that's one of the criteria that you can use to tell us. One of the ways you can tell them from series that had alveolar initials, in old, alveolar stops in old Chinese. That's how you can tell an old Chinese lung series from an old Chinese dung series, or tang series. Because dung or tang will have T, but lung will not have T. Okay? Not clear? Not clear. But never mind, it's, it's not important. Okay, example, another example. An example of HL, capitalizing to Xi. Other example of HL, capitalizing to Xi. And that was done in the first century CE. We have examples, we have a famous example of the, the Japanese island, Yamato, transcribed with a Y 
that comes from an old L. So it was already, the Ya was already, the L was already changed to Ya in the first century AD. Okay? Com comments on nasal on uh, palatalization? So, bilabials are not palatalized. Bilabials never palatalize. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, 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 in China. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I have a question about that. Um, mm -hmm. Types A and B, so they are actually derived from the rhyme tables, and they're not really present in the rhyme books, are they? Oh no, they are present in the rhyme books. The, the, the rhymes, they are present but not named. Present but not named. Uh, well, let me see. That's the question because... Um, Some you... rhymes, I mean the classic, the, the rhyme, you're right, I mean, the rhyme table classification is is based on the rhyme books, and it's sort of uh, you can see it in the rhyme books. I mean, you can see it uh, almost. Uh, no, it, it is there. In fact, it is there because the, 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 in the rhyme, uh, because you get different fancy spellers for type A and type B already in the rhyme books. You get different sets of fancy spellers, initial fancy spellers. Because the question is, if types A and B go back such a long way and already had a strong effect, how come these people who were reflecting on the language and describing it um, came to uh, formalize it so late as the four divisions, which are, well, the formulation four divisions, it must be a very late thing, like 900 yeah. AD or something, yeah. but probably it was there later. And the thing is, um, how come it didn't become part of the, the system as a sort of explicit concept that they would help them divide? Well, as I said, you can see it in the Rhine books uh, in late in the late six hundred in the late six hundred or, or in the late five hundreds in the Qingyan Shu and, and in the in the Chi Yu because you have different fancy spellers different fancy spellers for type AP, type AB, type AT, type AT, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you get different uh, different initials. I mean, the rhymes can be classified fairly easily. I mean, it's, it's really not so difficult to see in the, in the rhyme books. So, although the, 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 the name was not there, it was good. Okay. We don't even know, maybe they had a name for it. But you, you can use external criteria to to say that a reward is type A that you already in the from the fancy that they're using in the, in, in the late sixth century. Because they used some equipment for linguistic description drawn from the Sanskrit and Sanskrit didn't have that kind of thing so perhaps they didn't have a concept so they didn't put it to writing but perhaps it was in use as something that people knew about the rhymes. Yeah, it's, and pos it's possible. possible. We, we don't know. Uh, it seems they were aware of it at some level. Yeah. Okay, now let me tell you about uvulars. That's one of the big, uh, no, uh, big new things in, in, in our system. Well, not so new, in fact, because uh, because Pan reconstructed them before us, Pan Wuyun, in 1997, 10 years ago. So why reconstruct uvulars? Well, in Middle Chinese, you have a set of consonants which are called traditionally lar laryngeals, o yin, and they are the global stop. X, that is something like H, uh, xiao, uh, xiao mu. H, which that's that's in Bell's orthography. Okay, so that the H is a voiced sound. That's a voiced fricative, either a v or a r, either a, a, a velar fricative or a uvular fricative or even a laryngeal figure. The same 
initial with a yod, Bill would not normally give, consider these to be different initials, but in Middle Chinese, in the tradition, in the uh, Yin Yun Shui tradition, they are named differently. The second one, the first one is called Yu Si, the new number four. And the third one, the, the, the next one, sorry. This is Yu sorry. sorry. So this is Xia, Xia Wu. And uh, this is Yu San, right? Uh, so they name them differently, but they're in, in, in complementary distribution. And this is Yod, which they also consider to be a laryngeal, strangely in certain ways. And this is called Yu Si. So these two have a similar name, but this is number four. Sorry, this is number three, and this is number four. U, U three, U four. Having to do with the with the, the tables, the, the the divisions in the the rows in in, in one table. So, Middle Chinese has these sounds known as laryngeals in the tradition, and in earlier systems, including. Mine of 1999, Bills of 1992, uh, Li of uh, 1971. These global stop and X were projected back to Old Chinese. Okay, so it was assumed that you had a, a global stop in Old Chinese and a uh, 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 laryngeal sounds in Old Chinese. Um, but Tan, in 1997, Tan Wuyun reconstructed uvulars. So it's a Minzu Yuan 1997. And he reconstructed uvulars such that the uh, Middle Chinese double stop came from a Q, Middle Chinese X, He, Xiaomu, came from QH, and Middle Chinese Yusan came from capital G. Now, what's the advantage of doing that? The advantage is that when these Middle Chinese initials occur in the same phonetic series, the alternation between them is like that of te, te, and ge. Okay? If you have a phonetic series, if a character that's Middle Chinese double stop has the same phonetic as the character which is Middle Chinese X, uh, or Middle Chinese HJ, then it's a little weird because normally in phonetic series, stops and, Afri and fricatives do not mix. You will not have, for instance, in the same series, a T and an S. Okay? You get stop series, fricative series, but not mixed stops and fricatives. So why would you have a global stop and an X in the same series? If you do. So that's a little strange in the classical interpretation. In Pan's interpretation, it's better because it's no more at the old Chinese level when the characters were created. It's no more an alternation between a stop and a fricative. It's an alternation between a voiceless stop, a voiceless and aspirated stop, and a voiceless aspirated stop, and a voiced stop. Okay, so that's normal, the normal kind of alternation that you get in phonetic series. So here's an example. These three characters all have this phonetic. Okay. Now if you say, now this is Middle Chinese HJ, this is Middle Chinese X, this is Middle Chinese double stop. It's a little weird to have this kind of alternation in the series. It doesn't look like anything you know. But if you say that this HJ comes from a capital G, that this X comes from a capital Q, X, Q, uh, aspirated Q, and this golden stop here comes from a Q, then no problem. That's the normal kind of alternation. Okay, it's like a da da da, da 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 in a phonetic series. It's very usual, very common. Okay? Is there, is there any question?
Now, I'll put this on the on the. Put this on. There. <coughs> now, another advantage of uh, reconstructing nucleus is that it's not in. <coughs> it's not just in phonetic series. It's also in word families that you find these sounds alternating. Okay, you find these sounds alternating in word families too. Now this is this is more, this is even stranger because here we're, with word families we're not dealing about phonetic similarity. We have when two words belong to the same word family, they've got to have the same root, and to have the same root means that they have to have the same initial. Okay, so. The other advantage of reconstructing nucleus is that when you have a mix of these initials in word families, then you can explain. You know, if, if you reconstruct if you reconstruct all Chinese vowel stuff and all Chinese X, you will, and they are in the same in the same phonetic in the same family, you will not be able to explain. Examples: this one Han, bear resentment, and An dumb, silent pattern. How do you explain that? This can, this can come from a G, but how do you get a global stub out of a G? You can't. And this, this is clearly the same with family. Other example, even, even more uh, convincing. Same word, frog, has two readings. One, HW, which can come from a GUA, and one with global stop. Now, how do you account for that? How do you get a global stop, a, a, a labelized global stop from a GUA? You need some kind of, uh, you need a way of explaining that. Nucleus will allow you to do it. Other example, name of a bird, exactly the same, H and global stop. Uh, other example, that's a verb meaning to bind, HW double stop. To catch, HW double stop. Two readings for the same, for the same word. Obviously, morphological alternation. Okay? So you've got to explain these things as morphological alternations. Different affixes, same root. And to do that, you need uvulars, because dealers will not let you do it. Uh, <coughs> Okay, now we explain, we, here we have, look at this example, Han, to bear resentment, Han, silent, pent up. The difference in meaning between these two is that this is, this is more volitional than that. Okay, to bear resentment is to, 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 to nurse a grudge, to really, to entertain a, 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 a grudge, to not entertain, but to, to nurse a grudge, really. So this is more volitional, and it makes sense to explain the difference in semantics with the M prefix. And the M prefix will voice an initial, okay? So, suppose that you have that MQ, M, that, that you, that, suppose that the, the root has, has a uvula, QQ, type AQ. Then this type AQ will be voiced by by the M here, but not not there, and then this Q will evolve to lower stop, and this one will evolve to H. Okay, so that's our explanation. Same thing here. You have a verb. Okay, so same same kind of explanation. In these two cases, we have the M animal prefix, which will do the same job. It will voice a Q, and you will just have an alternation between two forms of the same word one with the M prefix, and the other without, right? And this is not a case of, this is not a case where the, uh, it's not iambic here because it would give some meanings. All right, is that clear? Any questions? Yep. Do you have any examples for a series containing Middle Chinese Y? Middle Chinese Y? 
Uh, yes, that will, that comes in a moment. Okay. Uh, so, but now we encounter a difficulty because uh, if you assume, like with Pan, that Q, QH, and capital G evolve to middle Chinese laryngeals, then you encounter some phonetic series in which you have both dealers and laryngeals mixed together. So how do you account for that? And you also get word families that do the same. Word families where you get dealers and laryngeals, middle Chinese dealers and laryngeals. Okay. Examples. Shadow. Ying. Jing. Middle Chinese double stop, middle Chinese key. How do you account for that? If you reconstruct the Q here, then how do you explain the K here? To cry, two readings, one L, global stop, one K, K. If you reconstruct the global stop here, as Han does, then how do you account for this K here? Clearly, in order to solve the problem, you need a way of getting Vers, getting Ks out of Qs, getting Vers out of UV getting middle Chinese dealers out of all Chinese dealers. There must be a context in which all Chinese dealers evolve to middle Chinese dealers. Okay. And our proposed solution is that all, all Chinese dealers evolve to MC dealers when? 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 After a <laughs> syllable. Sichuan. That's our proposal. Okay. The rationale here is that we think that the schwa in the pre-syllable will front the uvular to a vowel. Because although schwa is not a front vowel, it's a central vowel, it's, front, it's much more fronted than a uvular, so it will pull a uvular front, from front ends to a That's our explanation. It's, uh, it's, it's a hypothesis. And it may turn out to be wrong, but for the moment, that's how we do it. Illustration. Shadow. Well, yin, we get out of qr. And jing, we get out of Iambic prefix QI. Right. To cry, L we got from we get from QQR and this one we get from Iambic prefix QQR. Now These assumptions allow us to account for difficult phonetic series. You know the phonetic series of phonetic series of sui, year, GSR 346. That's the number of the series in grammar of solitary sense. Calgram GSR. Well, sui, year, sui, beard, sui, rustling of wings. Four to splash. Way, lots of water. Do you sure not? Hui, bad weeds, filth. Hui, ample deed. Hui, tinkle of bells. Yue, sound of vomiting. Hui, to wound damage. That's a weird kind of series. And when Tonga saw that, well, he was a bit, uh, I didn't know what to do, really. he just for a tentative solution, and that's what he did. Sway, he reconstructed with an S. Huay with an X. Doesn't really make sense, why would you put these two together in a series? Uh, 
especially if the head word is S, why would they, you know, why would they use it for X? Same thing here, same here, X. Uh, double stop, double stop, X, X, double stop, KS. So really he's just putting, I mean, he, he doesn't know what to do, he's just uh, saying, I don't know, this could be, maybe KS goes to K. Uh, but why, why put these in, in the same series? That's strange. There's, there are other series that are better, uh, that would be better, better guesses for that. For writing these words. Now let's see Lee Fangwe's solution. Now Lee Fangwe's solution, we, uh, we don't... If Andre has in principle a reconstruction for all these words, but I've only used a few of those that we have in our database. So here, if Andre has SK for the first one, SK. Then he has a gold stop in this one, lots of water. And he has KW here. It's a little better, but it's, not, it's still not great. And I don't know how he gets the, the X's. I think he probably he may has he may have them from SKH. But still, why do you why do you get SK and double stop in the same series? That doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now in our reconstruction, we have sway. We think sway is SQH. And one reason for thinking that is that the mean dialects are quick. So the mean dialects keep, keep H in general. That's, that's one thing they do. Keep, keep, a, keep a preserve aspiration, preserve all time aspiration. And the rest is QWH, QQWH, QQWH, QW, QW, QQWH, QQWH, QW. And iambic prefix or iambic presyllable to the right. So this looks much more natural, straightforward, it looks much more like a, like a normal phonetic series, like the other phonetic series. <coughs> Any questions? Once again, because we keep the young type A and type B, could you please and then why we somehow went to English from type B? What is exactly happening with Zubius and type A? Because, well, now we have someone's answers here. Okay, and, well, it depends. Uh, Q, type AQ goes to level stop, type BQ goes to level stop. Type AQH goes to X, type BQH goes to X, so there's no difference here between, mm -hmm. with the both, both this one, there's no difference. Uh, but there's a difference, the type A, type B difference in, in with the voice ones. Uh, capital G, type A, capital G goes to H, type B, capital G goes to U, S, goes to Y, and I'm going to give examples of that later on. I haven't uh, discussed it. Now, uh, reconstructing u viewers aside from Wiener's allows us to explain why Wiener series, series often come in pairs. Now, remember, I gave you <coughs> the example of ko, ko, go type A as an example of uh, why we reconstruct uh, voiceless and aspirated, voiceless, aspirated, voiced. In the same in the same rhyme, oh, you get other series that have viewer initials, type A viewer initials. This is this has KKO words and also KKHO words, and then this has GGO words. So there's some kind of overlap here. All right, but these series, the difference between these series and those series. Those series only have viewers. 
and those have a mixture of leaders and their angels in Middle Chinese. In other words, <coughs> they are leaders. They are, these are leaders, and these are leaders. Okay, so if you don't reconstruct uvulars, there's no good reason why you why you should have two series to write TKO. Uh, <coughs> or two series to write KKHO, or two series to write GGO. But if you have uvulars, then it's clear these guys are veners, these guys are uvulars. And it's normal for uvular series to have a mixture of veer and laryngeals. Right? Example of uh, laryngeals in this, in this series, or this will uh, ho to exhale, this one ho, or ko, or ko to revile, to disperse. So this is in, in this series, and this is in that series. And as you can see here, you do have, you know, the laryngeal view occurs in a world family that has beards. So this has to be neutral. So we treat the form, we treat these as gears, these as gears. Questions? Yep. Can these mixed series or middle Chinese dealers go back to pre syllable Yeah, in, in, in the in uvular series, in a series in a series that is uvular, middle Chinese dealers go back to pre syllable plus uvular. However, that's in, early, that's in the early parts of the series. You often find, you see, that's, at some point, these series begin to attract true veers. Because you already have veers in them. You have iambic prefix veer. So they will attract true veers. So and the difficult, there is a difficulty here. Often you find a veer word, which, is, which occurs in, in a Wheeler series and in a Euler series. So that's, that's, uh, but that's normal and there's nothing you can do about it. It's basically a question to be solved by paleography. And so the series 336, so can you have just been showing us yeah. the graphic evidence of areas is more or less consistent than coming from the same field. And there are no extra Vilas coming here in the later period. This is a series where you have only one mm. Vilar from a Uvular. Mm. So, of course, since, since there is only one, that's maybe not enough mm. to attract true, true Vilars. Mm. Yes. Is there any evidence from me opening in from this possibility? Uh, not much, and we think this is because the change from uh, laryngeals, from, from uvulars to laryngeals, occurred early, before uh, the period of Mongolian contact. In fact, Mongolian has, you know, in Chinese, First you had these old Chinese leaders, and then they became laryngeals, and then Chinese recreated leaders, sorry, recreated uvulars from type A leaders. That is, around Han times, leaders in type A, that is the words that are now, that are middle Chinese leaders in type A, were pronounced further back in the mouth. And they are borrowed by Niao Yao as uvulars. So Niao Yao does have the videos, they, they correspond to Middle Chinese Type A videos. So it's a, it's a second, this is, to, this is to illustrate the fact that the period of Niao Yao loans, the Niao, uh, contact with Niao Yao, is later than the period when Chinese are his videos. Because Niao Yao has videos, has inherited videos, and Around Han times, 
when it borrowed Wieler's type A Wieler's from Chinese, it used its own new Wieler's to represent them. So that's that's a later that's that's a later period. I mean, do you have evidence of the first syllable in uh, those years that have Wieler Wieler's and become values? Uh, I cannot think of any. I uh, have to look. That's a good thing. Any questions? Okay. Okay, no, but still problems remain. Uh, we s still haven't seen what the middle Chinese reflexes of the voice universe are. I, I told you. But, um, so according to Pat, capital J goes to MCH in type A and HJ in type B. The problem is HJ mostly precedes W or U. It's mostly in rounded in words with rounded vocalism. vocalism. So it's a good it's a good outcome, good middle Chinese outcome for more Chinese word. But it's not good for for word. What, where would the W or the U come from? Okay, so we need another source that for, for Middle Chinese. So we need another, sorry, another reflex for Old Chinese, but other than HJ. Now in this connection, let me do a short excursus. We sometimes get in in, in Grammar Serica, you get twin series that are characterized by yod in Middle Chinese. For instance, GSR 720, yang, and GSR 732, yang. Okay. Uh, these are long series. There's a lot of words in each of them. And there's little lexical overlap between them, which you know, it can happen that you get two series to write the same, two phonetics to write the same sound, the same syllable in Old Chinese, maybe that's not common. But if, if when that happens, if, if that happens, then you expect a lot of overlap in the words. That is, a word will sometimes be written with this phonetic, at other times with that phonetic, or at least the, you will find several word family links between the two series. Okay, but here, in the, between these two series, there's very little lexical overlap. Very few word family links between the two series. So they have to have a different, uh, they have to be different. Calgren reconstructed Old Chinese Biang versus Xiang because you get, uh, you get Z initials in this series, but not in the, like, for instance. Uh, but after Calgren, the idea was Li uh, Fangui uh, abandoned the idea that there was a difference. He, he reconstructed both as Ran. Now Bill, in his book of 1992, reconstructed Liang versus Liang, meaning he wasn't sure whether there was a difference or not. He thought there might be one, but he couldn't, he couldn't tell what it was. And I, in my 1999 book, reconstructed both as type B lung. But that's, that was an error. You know, because these are long series, a lot of words in each of them, maybe 30 years, and very few words in common. Now, our solution is to say that of these two series, one is an L series, because that's that's the normal, you know, at, at the time that we, we, Bill and I have accepted Puli Blanc and Yahontov's idea that all Chinese L goes to Y. And we thought, or at least I thought, that Y was the only source. So Y was the only Sorry, Yeh had only one source in Old Chinese. 
only came from hell, and I think I managed to convince Bill of that. But that's a good uh, a good case. Here we have a good case that it's not. Uh, Now, our solution is to say that there are two sources for Middle Chinese work. One from L, and that's the Lang, that's the, it's the first one, 720. And we do indeed find Tibetan words with L, corresponding to words of that series. And the second one was capital G. It was New York. And, uh, but this one, the, the second series, never has L in Tibetan Burma. It has Y, and then sometimes it has the words that correspond to that series of Vilas or Y, but never L. And that's the case of Yang, sheep, so we reconstruct capital G, possible R, um, so Gang or Gang, and then goes to Yang. But if we are right that the series is uvular, then we should also find some, uh, well, other laryngeals like global stop or X, and there are no global stop or X, but we do find velar in the shoulders. We find qiang and jiang. Okay. And our interpretation for these is that they are. We have this uh, iambic pre-syllable that falls, but not before changing the uvular uh, to a k, to, 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 to a v. Right? So this is normal if the series is a tongue series. So Tibetan government has yang, chi. My interpretation for this yang, chi in the past was that it was alone from Chinese. Because in Chinese, I, I thought this was lung, and that it goes to Middle Chinese yang, so I thought it was a word borrowed from Middle Chinese or after the Old Chinese, period. but that does not make a lot of sense. Uh, so I now believe that we are dealing with a cognate here. We believe that in the cognates. Yes. Is, is there any chance that the word for Western tribes could be some sort of uh, word borrowed from one of those languages? The, the name of, um, say, a uh, Tibetan Burman tribe? Or? Oh, it could be, uh, but there, it could be, but uh, this will have. Uh, you mean it was borrowed from, it would be borrowed from a word with a Vida? At least that would have implications for the reconstruction of uh, Tibetan Burman if uh, Old Chinese had uvulus and used uvulus to borrow a word from an old uh, Tibetan Burman language. That means that perhaps there were uvulus in Tibetan Burman too. Or, oh, but that's a big, that's a wild guess. Well, I, we'll discuss, I'll, I'll talk tomorrow about the possibility that Tibetan Burman had uvulus, and uh, the, the possibility is uh, uvulus have actually been reconstructed for Sino Tibetan by Stauste and Theos. Uh, and there is some, there are reasons to think that there is uvulus in, in Tibetan Burman, uh, but the, the approach uh, will, will rely more on comic words. Than on, than on loans. There are not so many loans in that. There are not so many Tibetan Burman loans into Chinese. Yes? Yes, yes. No, it's fine. That's a small idea because you know somehow a uh, few voices in Pula and voices aspirated and aspirated quite well. I guess it's in the constructed and we have more problems with the voice. Variant of the series because you cannot trace it as clearly as the rest. So I think we can trace it as clearly as the rest. Okay. Uh, I have just haven't given you a lot of examples because, and I think one of the reasons is that I haven't had enough time to prepare. And uh, one reason for that is that my computer broke when my computer died on me, and so we'll be 
as I need Chinese characters, the only time that I can prepare is here, so uh, I don't have enough hours to, to do it. But uh, okay. we think the yod is really well, we think the yod as a reflex of G is, is really well supported. Okay. No, but it just was an idea because what normally happens in our so we experience is that when you have a new series, the voice does the first one to throw out. So it most probably something which was the first to disappear from the series. That's why you can it's, it's, it's most probably part or you have less. Yeah, that may, that may be a factor. The first to fall out. That may be a factor. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to say that it's more. Um, there are competing explanations for why. Um, like when you have a B in Middle Chinese, it can be either an old B or it can be a. a, a, a a secondary B from a voice by, from a, by a nasal prefix, and we encounter this problem here too. So we think that some of the yods that we have in Middle uh, Chinese are actually voice cues. So there are a lot of complexities here, but I think on the whole, the idea that the normal reflex, the normal Middle Chinese reflex of type B, capital G, is, is yod. I think this is, we think this is yod. Well just one small point, because that's speaking about the word she. It might be alone in she I have a very clear global stop beginning to work. You have a global stop beginning to work? Yeah, very clear. And the rest it fits and the not nasalized vowel, so it would be a perfect thing reflecting it's a previous word. Wonderful. So how long is it? What is the word? N. N. So it looked like, because it doesn't look like anything to that one, yeah. so that definitely a different reflex. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say that? Uh, yes, how, how long do you, is it, is it over? Yeah. It's not 22. 22, yes. When did you say it's not, it's not now? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's, there's, there's more, but... I will tell you about it. Or well, shall I just, just say it quickly or in five minutes? Or maybe after the break? After the break. Because everybody gets to tell you. So you get, sometimes you get weird alternations between middle Chinese eng and middle stops or laryngeals. For instance, this character has two readings. It means cooking, cooking pot. Cooking pot. And it's got, it's read both nie and gie. How do you get that? I mean, it's the same two readings. It's either dialectal or morphological. And uh, it, we don't really like the idea that it's dialectal because we don't see any connection with geography. Exactly the same alternation in the same phonetic series, in a, not, in a completely different word, nie and gie. How do you get that? Other uh, case, you know, uh, way meaning false as an eng, but uh, way to make or do as hj. How do you get that? Uh, look at this one. Uh, yeah, covered galleries on both sides of the eye. And xia to cover. How do you get that? Nip, dangerous, versus keep, urgent, urgency. How do you do that? And nip and hip, great, powerful. Nim and king, precipitous. Uh, now, in all these examples, you get an eng, and in the same word family, even in the same, written with the same character, you get that. You get here, you get G's, H, J, X, K, X, K, H. And all these are possible reflexes of uveus. Okay? G can be a reflex of uvira if you get, if you get a, uh, an iambic prefix. This is a reflex of GW. This is a reflex of uh, QH. This is a reflex of iambic prefix Q. 
this is a reflex of QH, this is a reflex, this can be a reflex of QH if there is an ion between the uh, So, we think that this happens with laryngeal, with uvulars, but not with veters. You will, you will not get an A out of a uvular, out of a veter. You will get an A out of a uvular. And when do you get it? When uvulars are, and certain uvulars are prefixed with nasal prefixes, that will sometimes give you an A. Examples with M1A. M1A, you will remember, is the volitional prefix, volitional action prefix. So, uh, sorry, this is not, this is not uh, volitional. This is probably, <laughs> this is probably uh, the um, instrumental M, M1. So it's, forget whether the, the, it's M1B or whether it's M1C. But this one is volitional. And we reconstruct here, you can say MG versus M capital G. So the M capital G will change the G into a Vler, mm -hmm. and the MG will give you an M. Uh, same thing here, except that it's a different prefix. Now you also get capital N plus U Vlers. And look at these, all these examples, they're all adjectives. False, cover, dangerous, great, precipitous. Mm -hmm. So this is a good context for M. All right. So our explanation is that this one uh, way is capital N G W, and this one is just G W, no capital N. It's a great. Uh, this one is capital N QH, it will give you an A. And yeah, this is just this is just QH to cover. This will be capital N Q, and this will be iambic prefix Q. This will be capital N QH, and this will be just QH. And this will be capital N QH, and this will be iambic prefix QH. All right? Very interesting. Uh, I think Bill will tell you more about this tomorrow. So, any. What can we talk about? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, you said uh, for uh, GSR 346, uh, there are no evidences in Hong Yen and uh, in Ming because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the changes uh, were before uh, uh, they came in contact uh, to uh, uh, Hong Yen and uh, Ming, right? No mean, yes, not mean. I mean, mean is a, a is yeah. no, it's not a question of contact. Con okay. Contact between Hmong and Chinese and mean, it's mean is a daughter language of, of that. Yeah, but uh, uh, mean was also separated uh, from China uh, a yeah. uh, long time and uh, it came uh, twice in contact. Okay, uh, so what you what you say? Yeah. Why do you not get evidence of uh, iambic prefixes? Yes. Uh, but uh, the uh, the language uh, which was transported in, uh, in later time uh, was uh, always uh, the literal language. It means it was a, a spoken language uh, long, long before uh, the, the language uh, uh, which was uh, exported uh, to uh, Hong Yen or uh, uh, to uh, Ming people, right? Exported to Hong Yen, yes, but not to the Ming. Uh, we, uh, we think proto mean is just the daughter language of the Chinese, no, no contact situation there. There may be some loans, but we, we, can't, tell, we can't tell any loans if there are. But if, you're, if you, is your question why 
does mean not give evidence of... Uh, you know, uh, I, I, uh, my question is, uh, uh, what, uh, what time uh, was this uh, change? Uh, the queue, the usual? Yes. We think early enough so that the, the Hongian languages do not have uvulars corresponding to the uvulars we reconstruct. Yes. Contact between Old Chinese and Hongian is in the late Old Chinese period. And so we assume that in the late Old Chinese period, maybe 300, 400 BC, these uvulars had already changed to uh, laryngeal. Mm -hmm. So that will explain why we don't we do not see them in in Hongian, why we don't we do not have universe in Hongian. Now the separation of mean is even later than that. So of course mm -hmm. at the time they separated uh, the uh, there would not have been any uvulars left in proto mean. There were already laryngeals at the time that were being separated. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, why does mean, why, do, why can I not think of any example of mean having iambic, sorry, having softened velars? We should be able to find in mean softened velars corresponding to uvulars, to our old Chinese <coughs> Yeah, because if I'm if if we are right that uvulars go to vilars after an, I, an iambic presyllable, then protomine should have inherited those vilars with an iambic presyllable, and it should reflect the vilar as softened. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to find that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, I have to check. It's not. It's not. It's not obvious. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to look into it. Yes. Another question to the mean. So um, the protomin, um, the supposed protomin. In, in which time span is this supposed to? to be? According to Ding Pangxin, and it seems it seems correct about yeah. 100, 200 AD. That okay. is when probably yeah. separates. Yeah. But there there are no written sources for. Um, there are no written sources, no. but protomin L had already changed to D in protomin. Mm. Okay, so that's it's at least late time. Protomine does not keep all Chinese eyes as well. So they will already change to B. And L A M H L to that means double L has already changed to B. And H double L has already changed to TH. So that's first century mm -hmm. AD. Yes. What's the morphological make up of the first up on the list? I mean, we don't know. Uh, we would have to understand. The, we would have to know what the root means, to, so the, okay. and we don't know what the root means. So the S prefix is just there to account for Middle Chinese and S in yes. the Maybe maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should use a dot here instead of a instead of a hyphen. We, we can't be sure that it's not, that it's a prefix because we don't know what it's we don't know what it's doing. However, it's a it's a noun, it's a time noun, and if the root is a verb, then it could be a nominalized form of the verb using the nominalizing as prefix. And I think that's what's behind our that's that's we have at the back of our minds. Yes. And the question is just, uh, since we are speaking about handsets, there was something that Bill mentioned yesterday. He was speaking about something that seems to be related to the words with some differences in the initial. So you would have a related form, aspirated and aspirated form, since it is a stop. 
with type A, with type B, yeah, yeah. You know, the, what what is the space of your variation? What are possible things that can be? What are possible what? Possible variations. Okay, yeah. I, I, I talked about that in my presentation yesterday uh, at the end. You remember I uh, gave you examples of word families, uh, the, the definition we have, what we give of word family is a set of words that have exactly the same root and different affixes, but there are also cases where words with similar pronunciations and similar meanings have roots that are that differ in things like aspiration, type A, type B, presence of shangsheng versus absence of shangsheng. In some cases, you will have a different vowel, like E alternating with an A, and you don't know why. Uh, I think these are the main, the main types. But coming back, for instance, to aspiration, if you have a possibility of uh, in related words to have a variation between plain and aspirated stuff, um, it's just coming back to, to what you were saying that, for instance, in, in property that the government is reconstructed. There are only two series of stops. And in what we know from the Berlin language is that aspirated series so arise later. So, is it possible that this was the same development that uh, It's possible. Earlier? It's possible. And certainly if you wanted to show, if you wanted to show that aspiration is secondary in Chinese, you would have to look very closely mm -hmm. at, these, uh, at these alternations. So, perhaps this is a leftover of, uh, of a period where uh, you know, maybe uh, there's a difference. Certain prefixes will give you aspirated, or absence of certain prefixes will give you aspirated, and you get non aspirated. Mm -hmm. In other cases, we don't know. It may be something to do with prefixes. Uh, but what? I have two questions. Um, one is concerning this word family. Um, this is not a word family. Uh, sorry, this uh, phonetic series. Yeah, because I was thinking <laughs> word family. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, isn't it strange that you should have so many forms which are homophonous at the old Chinese stage without seeming to have anything in common from the point of view of their meaning? And also the fact that you have of quite a lot of onomatopoeia in this phonetic series, potentially. The sound, sounds of vomiting, of bells, of water, and of wings. So what would be an alternative explanation? Oh, I don't have one, but it's just that I, 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 I just noticed that you've got the form W-Q-W-A-H-A-T-S, which means three things that cannot well, at least one of them cannot possibly, it doesn't seem like normal home. I mean, it's strange to have a homophone for this, like ample, deep, and a tinkle of bells, which can go with the rustling of wings, but, and a splash of water. But I thought that maybe when you reconstruct such homophones, you have also an idea about the... These are probably very rare, rare forms that, you know, are very, very, uh, well, unique forms that occur once and not actually done enough. Many of them. And then the other question was about this uh, iambic pre-syllable. It just disappears after it has helped you really become. Yeah, all iambic pre-syllables disappear in Middle Chinese. Regular rule. Yeah, but that, that was the problem with the schwa because apparently the schwa seemed to be unstable in the iambic pre-syllable and you had a tendency to fall, yeah. but when it falls, the consonant of the iambic pre-syllable will come into contact with the, the initial of the, the root, yeah. and if this consonant is a, a sonorant like an M or an N, we would expect the uh, initial of the root to voice. Yeah. But then I, I have the impression that I saw an example later on at the end about these strange cases you were speaking about where you got an M, which came into contact uh, with 
put in a iambic pre syllable uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, further down I think uh, no oh, okay so and it's voiced yeah okay Question, because you promised to talk about the case and what happened about politicization in Part B. Um, politicization of Felix before Frank Fowles. You said that the cases. Politicization of Felix before Frank Fowles. And you said there were cases, there were series, was both Felix and Felix. If you could make it an example. Uh, I think that two series has. Uh, I think that two series has some videos in it. I would need my camera to here. Uh, let's see. We're going to look for the series 864. So this guy here, the dealer, mm -hmm. this one the dealer. Okay. Mm -hmm. All dealers, thank you, dealers here. These must, Mister, these must have had an R. But, uh, Right. Okay. But what for instance for the, the bottom floor you put capital G in brackets for now it's the first Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. these are cases where you get a you get a G in Chongyo, in Chongyo division, in Chongyo Sigan, this is Chongyo Si, this is Chongyo 3. So in Chongyo 3, we have an R. And this, and here, we write capital G because we mean by this a G that we have no, I mean, 
a uvular, it's, it's not the same type of OG as it, it's not a uvular type of OG. We should we have an, uh, this is not a this is not a uvular series, it's a severe series. So this capital G here doesn't mean uvular. Mm -hmm. It means it's a different it's a different symbol by the way. This is just the capital of normal G. Okay. The phonetic capital G is another another symbol. <coughs> so this means a G which we would expect to palatalize because there's no there was no R after it. There was no R because it's Chinese division. Um, but it doesn't palatalize unexpectedly. So we write a capital G to show that we don't understand why it doesn't palatalize. And we don't understand why this K does not parallelize either, because it's strongly four, as you can see from the I in it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is strongly three, so we have we understand why it does not why it does not parallelize. That's because of the R. But here, yes, this is unexpected. We don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Um, you were also talking about the case where you disagree with Spoon Chan mm -hmm. and the uh, reason for developing the test, the previous test, and most probably Spoon Han Chan's line of reasoning is following the following examples where it normally causes the divorcing. And uh, so you say that it gets divorced. Um, Contrary to what is expected, do you know of any languages in other cases where prefix S gets divorced in this position because it's well, somehow no logical to expect to reverse, but well, of course, it, maybe it's also possible that it gets worse, but do you know of any examples in other languages where it does get worse? Where S, S, B, S, B, S, G goes to Z? Yeah. Because in Tibetan Burma, it's just also what comes to my mind, it's regular that it would make things. I think you said that this is the pronunciation of French. This is the voice. Okay. Uh, what? It's about to pronounce the smell of the bell cadena. The smell of the bell cadena. The smell of the bell cadena. L'organisme français d'espionnage qui s'appelle le SDEC. Comment tu prononces SDEC. Dis encore SDEC. Mais parce que je suis du midi. Justement, tu ne fais pas le truc du midi. Si, je n'ai pas dit SE, je dis SDEC. Tu as dit SDEC SDEC. Exemple. Would the possibility be that. Mm -hmm. It's also some kind of ionic thing. It could also contribute to some extent to voicing because you would have a vowel and throwing into nature, and then it could also somehow. I, I expect that if there was a vowel in between, the, the vowel would sort of enthusiastic. Well, any kind of interaction between uh, between uh, the and the. Okay, so I, you're looking at the. Okay, it could be this or it could be that, but look at the predictions. Uh, mm. Look at the predictions on Yao Yao, for instance. Uh, uh, if in a pair like. Uh, you know, we do have pairs in Yao Yao that correspond to pairs of Chinese, you know. Mm. Yeah, you, you get a, a, a voiceless intransitive in Chinese and, and the corresponding voice intransitive. We have those in Chinese, and we see those borrowed into the area. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose Kong is right, mm -hmm. then you're not going to have any pronunciation on the mm -hmm. intransitive one. Mm -hmm. okay? But you do. Mm -hmm. And Kong does not have anything to say mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a question about one of the first slides, and that you had an example of this voicing thing, and you said it wasn't a good one. Can okay, you go back? <laughs> uh, it's about Chang path between fields, but I just wanted everyone to see it. <laughs> you can tell us why it's not a good example.
Okay, so what was the first slide? I think it was one of the first slides, yeah. About this Mlung Zing uh, Chai. Yeah. Uh, why did you say it wasn't a good example? Because the uh, because the initial is not a start. I mean, uh, was, this, I was trying to illustrate the voicing by M, voicing of voiceless stops by M. But the, the initial is an L, so of course it's not, it's not a good example. Okay. Because I ask you this, it's not in the simple course. It is because um, earlier we talked about the uh, sure and s uh, to feed and to eat and to feed, yeah. and you said that this is one example when you can see that this uh, s prefix actually doesn't disappear, but it voices. And the form from all Chinese was I, I I think smlucks. Yeah. But in that case, if in this this example, you know. <laughs> Uh, S does not get voiced by the following summary. However, it gets voiced in smlux. Why is that? It's because ml all by itself goes to j. Okay, so we suppose that the S got voiced after ml okay. got to j. But SN will not be used. SN will not be used. SL will not be used. Alright? My, like we mentioned this example again, um, one thing I'll be interested in is um, the, well, the phonetic, how are uh, all Chinese um, complex initials, complex onsets uh, evolve phonetically into their middle Chinese reflexes. And if you have something like um, um, no, and ML no, yeah, yeah. giving um, the, well, Z, but C, C, E, O gives um, just Z. So where, where does the palatalization go? If M, M, L gives Z, and then you have S, Z. And so you, get, you get Z, and S gets, gets voiced by the Z, by the Z, Y. Okay, and you get Z, and yeah. Z. Yes, yeah, so Z gives you Z. Simplifies as Z. In, in general, S plus S is voiced by the following voice stop strand, and the voice stop strand disappears. You're left just with S. S S G goes to Z. S capital G goes to Z. S D goes to Z. S Z Y goes to Z. So that's the source of Z in the middle chain. So if you if you're saying suppose like you 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 like suppose like Gong, you think that uh, S will not voice preceding a uh, preceding a voiced obstruent initial, then you're left with the the only possibility you have left is to treat Z as an old Chinese initial. And if you treat it as an old Chinese initial, or possibly an old Chinese prefix, you cannot explain it as being the same prefix as S applicative. So that's, that's, that, that's a problem, you know. There are many cases where, where, you want to treat, where you want to treat Z as really S applicative, because of the morphological job it does, because what it does, 
of what it does to the meaning of the, of the root. You want to say that it's really yes. And the only way you have to say, you have of saying that it's really yes is by supposing that it has been voiced by the voice that's been initial. Okay, but in general, um, are these your supposed sound changes attested in, in some other languages, Twitter, or anywhere else? Like, let your friends and just to say here, uh, M M L G G Z mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm not, I don't mean just this one change, but in general, are all these um, cluster simplifications from um, O C to M C uh, attested in, in some other language? Other than no, M L M L to Z, M L to Z Y. That's not attested as far as I know. That seems to be a Chinese specialty. This was found, it's not ours, it's, this was found by, by Schussler, and there's really very good comparative evidence for it. We have uh, evidence from Miao Yao, evidence from Taikadai, evidence from Tibet uh, Burma, foreign evidence, it's, that's really strong, uh, that NL goes to ZY. So we don't doubt it, uh, especially if you consider that L all by itself goes to Y, L all by itself characterizes to Y, and putting an M, M in front of it gives you Z, gives you Z Y. Why it does that, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe M changed to something else before. I mean, there was maybe there was an intermediate stage, but it's not it's not a direct change, <coughs> and we don't know what that intermediate stage was. But the M is built up. Yeah. yeah, I have another question about time. Um, the, these, these prefixes, um, usually in, for example, grammar languages, etc., they are derivational prefixes. But for me, it's not, it's sort of strange the idea that, for example, um, a stative verb, an adjective, is supposed to be derived and accordingly later than its sort of basic form. I can't really imagine that. So is the idea that both forms existed at the same time and are simply sort of variants of one root, or is it really the idea that they are derived from a root? I don't see the difference between the two ideas. Could you read? All right, yeah, just that the, 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 there is, for example, a transitive verb, which is the basic form, and that the intransitive form, the adjective, is derived by way of prefix later, or did they both, which doesn't seem logical to me, or did they both exist at the same time? Why wouldn't it be logical? Because I think um, that um, adjectives are a basic concept. No, I mean, it's, 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 the claim is not made that the class of adjectives as a, as a whole was only arose after only only arose when you had this in, the intransitive yes. end. There yeah. were basic, there were adject, derived adjectives yeah. in the language, yeah. but there was also a, a a process which allowed you to, to derive intransitive verbs out of transitive verbs. Yes, of uh, course, yeah, that's, that's, that's many of these were uh, yeah, yeah, but in transitive verbs, for example, they exist both at the same time. Even well, in the earlier texts. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's this particular process is found in Tibetan Roman languages. Uh -huh. In, in Jialong, for instance, yeah. you have exactly you have something very similar to what we reconstruct. Mm -hmm. You have a nasal prefix, which will assimilate to a root, and uh, it will assimilate to the point of articulation of the root, and it will voice the following initial. Mm -hmm. And it will derive in transitive verb and yeah. uh, transitive, almost exactly like this. Oh, yeah. okay. mm -hmm. So this is a very old process, which al already yeah. existed in, in the Roman. Now, it's an old process, but that doesn't mean that all the object, all, all, all the intransitive forms with the n with n prefix are old. Some can be old, some can yes, be old. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This this process is a very old one. It's inherited mm -hmm. from Sanyaka.
most of this morphology, incidentally, inherited from mm -hmm. has a sort of a um, parallels. Because in Bayern, it's already Bayern, it's already changed, indeed. It's supposed, it's supposed all Chinese learning. Another question about the uh, M3 fix, which is a uh, body part prefix. This is side two by two, isn't it? Yeah. I sort of remember that yeah, yeah, Umar yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, he yeah. mentioned it uh, yeah, also. Yeah. And uh, yeah. do you, in which languages did it exist? You... Mm. you get words such you get such words in, in many languages. Yeah. I think I remember one being a Naga language called yeah. Mpe. Uh -huh. Uh, but I, I can find that for you if you... If you, if you no, 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 it's just, yeah, it's it just because I sort of remember, and I wasn't sure if it was, for example, Mushai as well, he, he um, uh, I think he, he talked about it, but I don't, it's so... Mushai does not have to, no, so does no. not have... Uh, yeah, so maybe I, I just mix it up, yeah, yeah. okay. I just have one stupid question about this slide. Uh, why do you have the hammer character twice? Is it just an error or is there an arcane? Why do I have the same characters twice? No, yeah, the, for the hammer. Point. Is it Chui. one character? Chui. Chui. Oh. It's just... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're not reconstructing some... <laughs> okay, <laughs> you'll never know. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. Just too hard, too fast. And just uh, uh, to follow up on my question about this um, rice word, uh, I agree that well, maybe it's not borrowed in these other languages of the area, the the Tao word. But are there any reflexes uh, in other languages of the area of this root? Oh, rice. Uh, oh. There is a word in, in Garo which is lu, and it means rice seedlings. Is it the same or not? I don't know. It could be. Rice seedlings. It's the name of the plant. So, seedling is a young plant. You can go from the young plant to the yellow plant. I suppose this. Uh, yeah, Tao doesn't seem to be the old Sino Tibetan word for rice, for the rice plant. It doesn't seem to be the, name, the old name of the plant because it's not found anywhere else in that meaning. Since you've been mentioning some specific Chinese developments, like for instance, how to the South Yuan, that are also innovations of the Chinese, which would put it aside as a Tibetan language, for instance, or some. The methodology of uh, using innovations. Uh, would not serve to set Chinese aside. Chinese, any language has its own innovation. All languages have their own innovation. Mm -hmm. Chinese does have, and every single German language has its own innovation. So that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. What you need are innovations, not to put Chinese aside, but shared innovations that could tell you that Chinese forms a subgroup within another language, or innovations that would tell you that Tibeto-Burman is really a subgroup as opposed to Chinese. That's the kind of 
innovation to look at. Otherwise, in Chinese, you've got tons of innovation. Lexical innovations, Ren, for instance. Yeah. Ren for human being, or somewhere else. Yeah. But so can work with quick, for instance, for the students to put it more like short is to better run it, something to get an idea. Well, you would have to find evidence of, of words that words that you would be certain are innovations. You would have to be you would have to have a way of knowing that the suppose suppose Chinese had some words in common with some Tibetan kind of German languages, like maybe Burmese. And you had a way of being sure that these words are innovations, not retentions from Sino Tibetan, then that would be an argument I cannot mm -hmm. think of any but but, uh, is there anybody working on it? Because that's one of the most interesting questions about the sign of Tibetan language. Is anybody looking at the Not that I know. Um, another question. Um, in uh, Tibetan, as far as I know, there are several prefixes and um, suffixes of the S suffix, for example, which indicate what's called the different tenses of say aspects of etc. And since I'm very interested in aspectual systems in Chinese, is there any chance? I, I sort of had had the impression in your book that, that there was something maybe indicating, for example, actionality or things like that. Is there any chance to 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 maybe set up some sort of a system like this for Chinese? That for example um, lexical aspects of Verbs, event verbs, state, stated verbs. Okay, there we have something. Um, but also uh, action, action, action verbs. Uh, so, atavic action verbs. Is there any possibility to set up some sort of system? System. Uh, uh, well, the, the K prefix. The K prefix seems, seems to, in some cases, convey. The meaning of uh, imperfective or uh, yeah, explicitity. So that's I that's mind, that's yeah. one. And but you, they, they, you can't you can't really say it. it so you can you can change a word from from being the one to the other. With, uh, I think you can. I think you, there are pairs. Uh, really? Yeah. A few pairs, not, not uh -huh. many. And uh, the, uh, the prefix is actually uh, active in, in the Qin dialect, in uh -huh. Shanxi Fangyi. Uh -huh. So you can look at the examples there. Well, I think something about the and, um, so there is that. There is also the S suffix that yes, of course, that's yeah. a perfectivity. Yes, yes. So there, these would be the main uh, aspect related yeah. affixation processes that I know of. There may be others, of course, but yeah. so far that's, that's where we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I thought maybe you had some, something secret. <laughs> I would tell you. I yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, something you haven't published yet. Some, uh, some ideas or something like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have one question concerning, uh, so perhaps it's not directly linked to today's topic. It's about medial R and the way it evolved. Uh, in sort of B type syllables, was it just did it simply disappear no, no, no. by addition, or what kind of evidence do we have to say, well, this B syllable used to have R and this one did not have R? So, what traces did it leave? Uh, there's, it's in type B syllables, uh, first of all, you see a direct reflection of R in alveolar. In all Chinese, after all Chinese alveolars, as these become retroflex. Okay, so TR will give you a retroflex T in middle Chinese, yeah. type B. And the same with all the other alveolars. Same with the uh, alveolar affricates. Same with S. So all these alveolar coronal go to become retroflex when an R follows. Now these are acute initials. Mm -hmm. This situation is a little um, more complicated with uh, P and grade one. With grade initials, P and the labials and dealers. In these cases, the main way that we have of telling 
whether uh, uh, the initial we had a, a following R or not is in the so-called Chongyu Sandan contrast situation. Uh, if you, okay, there are, in certain rhymes of, of, uh, of Middle Chinese, you have a contrast between, between what the rhyme tables for Division 3 and Division 4 type B. So supposedly Division 3 type B had an R and Division 4 type B did not have R. There are exceptions to this, but in, 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 for instance in the I line you can't tell. You don't have the division, yeah. Uh, so it's, not the, it's, it's, it's in the year, year line. Uh, there is a certain... If, if there is a Chongyu or Chongyu Sandan and Chongyu 4, Chongyu 3 contrast in that year line, but the fact of having Chongyu 3 does not necessarily tell you that you have an R. Uh, but basically that's the way. It does not disappear. It, uh, it, it leaves, yeah, it, at least not completely. Yes. Um, from my impression I had was when I compared the idea old Chinese reconstruction and middle Chinese uh, many, in many cases where you have old Chinese R as a medium, um, you either have a pedophil glide, a, a J in, in middle Chinese, or you have a kind of vowel front in, in J. So you get more more fronted vowels than in old Chinese. But in, in many cases it seems to me as if the R turned into some kind of or at least look, the outcome looks as if there was some kind of impenetrable glide, which kind of reminds one of the L, L in Italian, for instance, well, when it comes to uh, E or V. And I was wondering um, what exactly is the reasons to assume that this media was an R, and not an L, for instance? Is it because of the weak reflex uh, initial condition? So that's um, the only possible way to, um, yeah, to arrive at weak reflex initial is to say that a okay, TR gets uh, for instance. And yeah, it could it not be yeah. something else. Uh, so that's one, of, that's one, one reason. Uh, it, it produces width reflexes, which is normal, normal for an R, but not normal for an, for an L. But formally, uh, what we now reconstruct as R was reconstructed as L. And what we now reconstruct as L was reconstructed either as Y or D. Okay. But uh, take a plate, the, the, you know the, this, um, place named uh, Alexandria. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a lot of places, a lot of towns called Alexandria. Uh, of course, uh, Alexandria um, founded several cities in Central Asia named Alexandria. But one of them was known to the Chinese in the, already in the 4th century BC, and they transcribed it as what we now reconstruct as in our system, it would be Alec San, sorry, Alexandria, Alexandria, sorry, Alexandraita, sorry, Alexandraita, that's how we, that's how we, that's how we would be constructed. And in fact, the Greek form would be Alexandreia, so that's why you get the right, Alexandraita. And that's fine, the L corresponds to an L, the R corresponds to an R. But in the former reconstruction, you would have Ayaksanlia. Uh, in the Fangui's re uh, reconstruction, you would have Ayaksanlia. Uh, that that's the Fangui's reconstruction. And it doesn't fit, it's reversed. Do you understand? Because for the Fangui, uh, Middle Chinese year, year came from R, so you would get Arak 
sun. Yeah, and uh, so he, he got it. He got it reversed. Just the detail about this word. Why sun? Didn't they have a sun at hand, or did it go through another language that had? Good question. Oh, no. Yeah. Good point. Are there more examples like this? I mean, that is quoted in the number of Philippian... Yes, there, are, there is a lot of... Com- in mean, this example, is nice. It's nice because you get, you get L and R in the same word, so you can see. Uh, but there are, of course, a lot of examples of, of, uh, of L's as we reconstructed, corresponding to foreign, to foreign L's. And R is really constructed corresponding to for an R. No counter examples? No, not, a, not, not in early times. It, it's really consistent. That's not our finding, that's Yakonto uh, uh, already in the, in the 60s. Well, probably some counter examples, but you know, they have to be. Looks of some kind. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, we go to lunch. And Bill will be there too to tell you about run. Thank you.